Hello, I'm Kyle Stallings. We're here at the Tomball Museum Center. It's uh, June 8th, 2023. We're here today to interview Kip Co. And uh, this is part of our video series where we're uh, taking video interviews of some of the family members of families who have made this area of North Harris County and South Montgomery County such a great place to live. You can see this video and our other videos on our YouTube channel at the Tomball Museum, at Tomball Museum. Would you state your name for us, Kip? Uh, William Kipling Co. And what do you go by? Kip. Kip. Great. Appreciate you being with us today. You bet. Uh, where were we born, Kip? I was born in Tomball, Texas. Which place or hospital? It was across the railroad tracks over off Hospital Street and Carroll. The old hospital. The old hospital. June 23rd, 1953. And who was the doctor who delivered you? Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham. Cool. Norman Graham. Yeah. Uh, we've had a few people give us stories about Dr. Graham. Do you have any Dr. Graham stories you want to share with us? <laughs> uh, my dad had a, a game ranch in Rock Springs. And Dr. Graham couldn't get off in time to to go, so it was on a Friday, and my dad said, Kip, can you fly Doc up to the ranch? And I said, sure. And so he he got with Doc, and they told me, said, oh, yeah, I'll fly with Kip, you know. Well, I had a little old bush plane, and... Uh, we, uh, Dad had cut me a runway in on the ranch, and... Doc got there that evening, and oh my gosh, he had so many things. He had little bug traps. He had just everything in the world. I didn't think we were going to get the doors closed on that plane, but anyway, we we got in and took off, and he was telling me about times that he used to fly. And uh, so when we come in, I, I dropped off in this canyon, the old New Aces River, and uh, he asked me, he said, what are, you, what are you doing down here? And I said, well, we gotta, we're going to buzz the runway. And he said, the runway? He said, I thought we were going to Rock Springs Airport. And I said, no, Doc, we've got a runway cut in here. He said, you're, you're not. And about that time, there was the, the ranch and his little 1,500-foot strip. And he says, oh, no, no, you're not going to land here. And I said, yes, sir, we're going to land right here. And there, and as we flew the strip, there was Dad in the jeep down there. And we come in and came over the fence and dropped it down and landed. And if you ran off the end of the runway, it went off into a, a little old gully. And uh, I got it turned around and got back up there. And Doc says, Arvid, I'll never get in a plane again with this boy. He said, I'm riding home with you. <laughs> So, yeah, that was the highlight of Dr. Graham. He was he was something else. Yeah, I bet that was a fun trip. Oh, yeah. Let's go. Who were your parents? Harvard and Bernie's Co. And I understand Harvard also. A.R. Co. He grew up here in, in this area, he, he right? He was born in Decker Prairie. All right. Yeah. Roughly when was he born? In 1920. And um, what other brothers and sisters did you have in Nell's family? I had a brother, or I have a brother, uh, Harvey Co. Yeah, and a sister, Michelle. Great. And where did y'all, when you were real young, where were y'all living? Uh, we lived in Tomball, Texas. Um, I say the outskirts. It's, back then, you know, Tomball didn't start until like South Pine Street. <clears throat> and then went to the railroad track. If you know where Glorier's Pharmacy is, our house set right where Glorier's is. And Dad uh, owned the lumber company right next door, which was Co Lumber Company. And he uh, later on sold it to Lester Natick. And uh, Lester took it and uh, made it a lot larger and, and nicer. It was a nice place to shop. I remember where Nidex was. Was y'all's co-house just west of there or just east of there? It was right where Glorious is sitting. Right, where right beside it. Uh -huh. Yeah. 
Cool. Yeah. And so how many years did y'all live there? Uh, Roughly. I lived there for seven and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to the farm out in uh, between Pinehurst and Decker Prairie. Can you show us kind of on a map roughly where that farm yeah, is? Yeah, uh, it's, if you, well, Kipling Oaks. Kipling Oaks was the farm. Of course, it wasn't called Kipling Oaks. It was just our farm. And uh, uh, in 19, I think 1970, uh, Dad said, you know, the way the taxes are and everything, he said, we're going to, we're going to subdivide it and and uh, and either move on from there and move to Decker Prairie or or either stay there. And we stayed there for years after after he developed it. And uh, and I graduated in '72, which I moved moved out, but I moved back. I built a house in there and lived there for years. So how did y'all? develop that subdivision how to build the streets and that kind of thing uh dad kept it all family all every street in there is named after uh, my sister my brother my mother my uh, cousins and and every everybody's name is in there that's really cool yeah all right so um Let's start out. What what schools did you go to? The first, like elementary school. All of them. Tomball. Tomball. Yeah. I ever from kindergarten on, you know, at the old school there, uh, where Kroger is back this side of Kroger. Went there, and then the intermediate on uh, Cherry Street, and then the the old high school right on on Main Street. The one that burned down and then it's built back right there. Were you in the one before it burned or after no, it burned? No, but I remember getting up at night. My dad uh, woke us up and we walked down from uh, where we lived right there, Glorier's. And I remember walking down there as a kid and uh, watching it burn mm -hmm. that that early morning. Yeah, that was a, that was a sight. I imagine it was. Yeah, yeah I heard it. You had the red glow all over Tomball back then. Yeah. So what are some memories you had going to the Tomball schools? Oh, Dragon Main on Friday and Saturday night. And, uh, going to football games. And I played up until, uh, well, my, fresh, my freshman year. And I got a detached retina. So that ended all anything from there on. Mm -hmm. So, you remember any coaches or teachers there? Oh yeah, uh, cousins, Turk, um, and my uncle uh, Howard Swan. He was a a coach uh, in Magnolia, and my and his wife, my mother's sister, Alma Swan. She was a teacher in. Magnolia, and then my mother was a high school English teacher. What was her name again? Bernice, Bernice Co. And uh, what school did she teach at? Tomball, Tomball High School. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I don't know. Uh, just we had a curfew of eleven o'clock, uh, and we would sit up in the old. High school parking lot, watch cars go by, and every once in a while we'd all get in our cars and take off and go drag Maine from the railroad tracks back to to uh, uh, either in front of the high school or either we'd go on down and and to Four Corners where Johnson's Pontiac was, and uh, <laughs> but those railroad tracks at the other end, you better be stopped where you got there because you were going to become airborne. Yeah. But um, anyway, and and my dad so he sold the lumber company to uh, Lester, Lester Nattic, Lester Nattic, and then uh, he built a concrete plant just right across the railroad tracks, which I think your dad was 
was part of the first development of it. I think initially it was, yeah. Yeah. It. And um, I remember riding my bicycle down Main Street uh, from there and go to the concrete plant. And uh, there was a donut shop down there and, and the Stokes Barbershop was there. And um, yeah, it was, uh, boy, everything's changed since then. Tell us about um, when you moved to uh, Decker's Prairie Stagecoach area, um, what was out there at the time? Nothing. We didn't have any neighbors. Uh, there was a there was a farm next to us, uh, north of us, and that was uh, Marshall Moore. And then my uncle uh, Lester Goodson, he had his farm on up on the other side of Pinehurst. That was my grandmother's brother. And uh, like I say, you we didn't have electricity. I believe I, I believe I was uh, becoming a freshman, and we got we finally got electricity. And Dad had an old generator to fire up at at nighttime and bring the refrigerator back up, you know, keep the food from spoiling and stuff. But uh, yeah, people ask me all the time, said, "Kip, if you had to do over again, what would you change?" I said, "Not a thing." But uh, yeah, and then my brother, he. In 66, 67, he went into the Marine Corps, so uh, it was just me. My sister got married and she was gone, and then my brother was gone. So it was just me. We lived a mile and a half down a dirt road to where the farmhouse was, and we had cattle and hogs and different things like that. So I stayed plenty busy. Yeah, it sounds like. Yeah. Sounds like a fun area to grow up. It was a pretty decent hunting out there. Oh yeah, it was real good hunting. Yeah, had the whole place to myself. Me and Dad hunted, and and uh, <laughs> there's a there's a funny story about that. Talking about cattle and hunting, uh, my dad told me and my brother Harvey said, "Y'all, uh, y'all take that truck." And y'all go over in stagecoach, and there's a pipeline. There's a subdivision called Timber Green, and right past it is a pipeline. And this pipeline goes all the way up and crosses Kipling Oaks. Said uh, a tree fell on the fence, and we got some. I believe we got some cows out. Said I want y'all to go around there and drive up the pipeline up the back way and see if y'all can see any any cows out. And back then there was no traffic at all and we drove up that pipeline and and uh, a little old yearling deer ran out in the in the pipeline i mean right in front of us and harvey told me he says pop it pop it deer in the head and so pulled 22 out and i killed that little old yearling <laughs> and we uh we did a quick clean on it right there and my dad had these corrugated water coolers on the back of the trucks he said we'll stuff him in that water cooler to keep him cool and <laughs> we stuffed that little old deer in that in that cooler and we took off and we got to the right where stagecoach road was and there's a game warden sitting there and i'm not going to mention any names of what game warden it was but he gets out and he said and he knew us you know we knew him we knew his kids and and uh he said uh kip harvey said i heard a shot I said y'all shoot back in there and said no we don't we don't know we didn't hear no shot he said yeah there was a shot back in here because he lived right on the other side back in there and um, so anyway uh, he walks the back of the truck and he's leaning up on the tailgate looking over in the back and there's nothing and and uh, he reached in his pocket I'll never forget he reached in his pocket and he pulled this little aluminum cup out and it telescoped and telescoped it out and he reached over and he run a, he, he he when he first started doing it, he looked away and he was talking to us and he shook it out and he threw it out there and he got him a cup and he got a drink of water and me and harvey were looking at each other <laughs> and 
and he said, he said, you know, there ain't nothing no better than that old good old well water, you know. <laughs> and he reached and he got another one. We're looking at the cup, <laughs> seeing if there was any color to it, you know. And and uh, there was no color to it. And he said, well, you boys be careful. And he slapped that cup shut, put it in his pocket, and went on. And me and Harvey have talked about that for years. But <laughs> <laughs> Pretty close call. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> back then times were different. Uh, it was it was something else. But anyway, and that and talking about that that same uh, pipeline I'm talking about came from Kipling Oaks, which was our farm. Uh, every year, my dad would open the gate and run our cattle. We'd bring the cattle out and bring them down that pipeline. And I would come on horseback and my dad would drive around to stagecoach and sit in the middle of the road and turn the cattle where they would go back east. And uh, I could say there wasn't no traffic. Mm. No, nothing went on. Anyway, I would get them going and we'd come down stagecoach road and he would be up in, in front of stagecoach where it turns back on Decker Prairie and he would be sitting there where the cattle would turn and we'd take them down to Peden Road and then he would be sitting there and we'd turn on Peden and go down Peden. And everybody back then either had gates or cattle guards. And so uh, I'd bring them cattle on in and we would winter, uh, we would winter the cattle where Kipling Oaks is now and we would summer the cattle there at my grandmother's place where there's a little subdivision called Coke Country. And that was, my grandmother lived right there on the corner. And uh, I don't know how many years we did that, but we'd bring them cattle back and forth. And I always tell everybody, I said, I was, uh, uh, me and my dad were the last ones who did cattle drives around Decker Prairie. Yeah. So, yeah. But like I say, later on we sold everything and no more cattle. And Lester Goodson, my uncle, he gave Harvey and I our first cow. And that's how we got started. And uh, and uh, I'll never forget, we had a little old bull. His, his registered name was LBJ. And so anyway, yeah, we'd bring those cattle back and forth until it, it just traffic started getting getting bad. And like I say, in 1970 uh, or 71, we got rid of all the cattle back then. Sounds like that's about when y'all started the subdivisions right. too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So was Co Country de um, developed after Kipling Oaks? Uh, Co Country got started. Um, I want to say right in there, close to the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandmother wanted a little, little spending money, and she told my dad, "says." cut out a couple of lots back there and sell them. Well, it, it went on that he made a circle back in there and he kept the rest of it. Uh, my grandfather gave uh, us kids, uh, me, my brother, and my sister, gave us all 22 acres a piece. So that was all back down in, in the back. And uh, we had the sawmill back there and uh, uh, me and my dad would run the sawmill uh, about every other weekend, big circle mill, and uh, that was that was the good old days. We had a good time doing that. What, what did you make with the wood once you sawed it up? Uh, we would sell some of it. I built my house in Duck Prairie uh, out of all of it, mm -hmm. and I've got big beams all through the house that my dad cut. That's why it's hard to you know, say, well, we're going to move and get out of here, and you know, it's getting kind of rough around here. But it's hard to leave. You got roots here, and it's 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 tough. Yeah, yeah. Your family's been there a long time. Yeah. So I've eight, eight been been in Decker Prairie since uh, 1835. So yeah. let's talk about some of that lineage. Uh, your dad's what was his name again? Harvard. And his dad was. AR also, it was Rux. Rux. Yeah. I've heard of Rux Co. Yeah. We had this photo that 
Okay. Oh, yeah. You hold that up for the camera and tell us who that is. Uh, this is this is them before cars. They were crossing the Old Spring Creek Bridge. This is my grandfather here on the on the right, and this is L. C. Laird. He was married to my grandfather's sister, Hattie Co. Laird, and they lived there in Decker Prairie. So. The other person is Ruxco, your grandfather? Right here, Rux, yes. yeah. And what bridge is that they're on? Spring Creek. Is that the one right there where 249 is now? Yeah, uh-huh. That's a really cool picture. Yeah, I've got I've got quite a few pictures. I just yeah. have to dig them up. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, so, I guess Ruxco grew up in this area too, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. he was born in Decker Prairie. My oh. grandmother was born in Magnolia in 1895. And... Uh, uh, what was her family name? Goodson. Goodson. Goodson, yeah. And like I say, Lester, Lester Goodson, that was her brother. Tom Goodson, in the 30s, he was chief police in Houston. And... Uh, that was all mounted back then. They had some cars, but it was mostly mounted uh, police back then. And I've got a, a big, long picture of him and uh, all the horses and the officers lined up across there. I've got that, that old picture. That's cool. Yeah. So did, I, did they have a pretty big family, other brothers and sisters on the Goodson side? Uh, yeah. And now you're getting to where I can't call names. Uh, but uh, it was it was my grandmother Lester, Tom, and I think there was another Willie. I didn't know any of them, um, but uh, yeah, it was a a different time back then. Yeah. All right. So let's go back to. Um Ruxco and his what was his dad's name? Do you know? Montgomery. Montgomery Doc Co. I've heard of Doc Co. And he he also lived out there in Decker Prairie area, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I've got pictures of of them and and the uh, cattle, uh, the the cow dogs and stuff, and and uh, uh, Wheeler Wheeler Co. His uh, his grandfather and uh, um, and all their brothers and yeah, I got some good good pictures. Do you know anything about how the Coes got in this area or what year roughly or where they came from? Uh, it wasn't long after uh, Isaac Decker got here. Um, year i couldn't tell you that's something i need to look into sorry wheeler wheeler might would know more than me um but um whereabouts did they come from the coast mississippi mississippi right. yeah yeah and then let's talk about isaac decker i said he came very early you know what year he came in he city? came through canada and came to texas uh in the early 30s 1830s and um, he got a land grant uh, through the Austin uh, colony and he was in Austin his land grant if you know where the uh, Congress Street is there's a bridge that everybody goes to that crosses the river there that the bats come out from underneath well that was where his land grant started. And it went all, all the way down from there to Williams Creek. And um, he stayed there until um, 35. And history books say that he left because of Indians, Indian trouble. I've got a, I've got a problem with that. Um, in 35 was when the um, the scrape came. Runaway scrape? The runaway scrape. Well, the runaway scrape started in, I think, September of 35. 
because of Santa Ana moving in and and causing so much trouble. I have a feeling that's more of why he left because in 35 he he was in Decker Prairie. And um, I, I just don't think it was just Indians. I think it was because of the uprising of, of Santa Ana and him getting mad because things were changing. They weren't for, you know, going by his laws. So tell us about hogs up in your area. Hogs in my area. Well, we, I, we raised hogs, yep. you know, as a kid coming up. I remember, remember, remember butchering hogs in the, in the winter time. And, uh, we never, we never sent, sent our hogs off to a butcher or anything. We did it ourselves. Um, uh, the only thing dad sent out as far as uh, the meat was to have uh, Victor and Bernie Bradigan would cut the bacon for us because they, they could cut it pretty, you know, precise. We couldn't do that, you know. And uh, my dad always wanted the, the rind left on the, on the bacon. And I can remember as a kid seeing pieces of rind left on the, on the breakfast plates, you know. But yeah, that was that's a good memory there. I remember that. You don't see rind on the bacon anymore. No, I've never yeah. seen it myself. Yeah. Did y'all have wild hogs coming through there? Back then, I don't remember any wild hogs uh, per se. I know that, I know open range back then, you know, all cattle back when my grandfathers were, were coming up it was all open range. There wasn't any fences. So their hogs ran with the, with the cattle. And that's how the feral hog got started is some of them they couldn't catch and they just got adapted to, you know, being in the woods life. And uh, they got away and that's how the ferals got, got started. Do you know of any other cattle brands that your ancestors had either on the Decker side or the coast side? Uh, the J3, not J3, that was my Lester Goodson's brand, J3. Uh, the JY was a brand. My grand, my great great grandmother, uh, Victoria, uh, bought some cattle. And that brand came with those cattle that she bought back whenever that was. And uh, I still have that brand, and uh, but that's where that came from. And, and still to this day, I don't know what Jay Y meant, but she kept it and used it. And then me and my brother, my dad got it, and then my, me and my brother got it and registered, registered it. And and then there was a co brand, C O E, and uh, yeah, that there's several brands out there but i can't remember yeah. you know what they are so did y'all have any uh, blacksmiths up in that area we had blacksmiths that's where i learned um i built me a blacksmith shop my grandfather uh, taught me uh blacksmithing and uh, then i would go over and after my grandfather passed i i got uh, became real good friends with uh, Norman Fraley and uh, Norman and I would would pass things back and forth about blacksmithing and stuff and uh, I taught blacksmithing uh, there for a little while and uh, and then eventually there was a, a one weekend I had a hammer in at my shop and at my shop was when uh, there's an organization called HABA and that was the day that HABA got started people getting interested and they called it Houston Area Blacksmithing Association. I didn't create it, it but it but I remember the signing of people wanting to get together and, and form a blacksmithing shop that was the day that it got started and it's a it's a good deal uh, you can you can join it and they have hammer ends and stuff and a lot of good people 
you know Dave Koenig oh yeah Dave was the one he was at my deal and he was the one that started uh, started bringing it all together I've seen him demonstrating up at Washington on the brass as he puts on a good show. yeah we went up there and uh, we built uh, hinges for uh, uh, a barn that they had out back and uh, I was in on that and uh, yeah, Dave. Dave turned out to be a pretty good hand at it. Yeah. So, what do you remember about uh, Norman Freilich and his shop out there in Rose Hill? Oh, all the brands and stuff. You walk in the door, and I know when you walk in the door and you look up on the wall right there, there's a co-brand up there. And he always wanted me to bring my brand over because he wanted to put it on the wall. But these were all brands that he made. But he did want local brands that he didn't make. He wanted wanted those up there also but um, that's that's quite the the uh, piece of history right there and um, we used to hang outside the door there where the forge was and stuff and and uh, oh he was a character we had we had some good times really did he was a mess and I understood it. both his he and his dad both were blacksmiths there at that same location. So a lot of history right there. Oh yeah, he was involved in putting our barn together. I understand here at the museum. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. We have a lot of blacksmith equipment out in the corner of that barn. That I think he helped put us together, helped us put together. Yeah. Way back there. I I would show him little little tricks that I had uh, learned over the years. I had a I had a man out of. Um, uh, Dallas area his name his name is Bill Epps and I would go up and stay it, at his house with him and uh, be there for weeks and work with him out in the shop and stuff and and uh, he taught me a lot a, a lot I mean my grandfather just got me started and and just really farm blacksmithing uh, you know blacksmithing is 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 not shoeing horses mainly it's everything from making wagon parts to um, hinges to whatever and everybody relates blacksmithing is shoeing horses and it's not and um, but yeah back then it was everything so yeah well, I've seen uh, on demonstrations they sometimes make those square nails you know Oh, yeah, yeah. But uh, I heard a story about those square nails. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard it, but they, they would build their houses with the square nails back then. And if they got ready to leave, like move from Alabama or Mississippi over to Texas, they'd burn their little house down and, and get the all the, gather yeah. up all the nails because yeah. those are so precious. Yeah. And they take them with them to Texas. And yeah. I don't know if that really happened. That's a pretty cool story. Well, I don't know about that, but I know that when a house would burn down by accident, they would pick up all the nails, the hinges, everything, and save them from the house and use them. One thing I wanted to ask you about is grist mills and corn mills and grits. Tell us about that. Uh, my grandfather had a had a barn. The ha the last house before the they moved out of the old the old ranch house. Uh, they built a house in 1952, the year before I was born. And that's the house that's still there now. At Decker Prairie? At Decker Prairie. And he had a, 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 a stockyard barn out beside the house and a little blacksmith shop. Out in that, in, in that barn, he had farming tools. He had plows, he had harrows, he had everything in the world. And I got in there and got to digging and found uh, pieces of an old cane press mill. And I got it all out and I rebuilt it. Everything was there. I rebuilt it. And um, every year, uh, I say every year, every year I used to go up the country to Henderson and I had a couple of friends that had cane patches and I would help them cut the cane, we'd press it and cook it down. And it was an all, it was a good two days because we would cut cane one day 
and then the next day we would cook cook it down into syrup and so uh over time these old fellas they they got away from it it was just too much too much work so there was an old man uh up the country he i was wanting to get a start of my own cane and see my my grandfather my great-great-grandfather doc doc had a cane patch there in in decker prairie and i don't know if this cane mill was part of it back then and it just wound up over there or what but uh it was horse driven and i i turned it into where it, it's power driven i don't have horse to pull it so uh, it's a whole lot simpler to crank up an engine and let it pull it and stuff that but i rebuilt the a bit rebuilt the mill and this old man he he told me he said kip if you want to get a start of cane he said i'm done he said just come get what you want so i went up there me and a friend of mine cut uh cane for a half a day and brought it back and i planted it and uh i had uh a bad year that year it didn't come up so then i had to find more cane so uh we went back another year later and and, and cut cane again and planted it and it came up really good so I stopped going up the country because, like I say, everybody had stopped raising cane and, and, and syrup, doing syrup. The two friends I knew that I'd done it with. So I decided, well, I'll just start my own operation. So last year was my first time to uh, cut, press, and cook uh, syrup down. So uh, I knew all, you know, how to do it, so it wasn't a big deal. And uh, uh, Sandra Bradigam, uh, around the corner, she helped me cut, cut it, press it, and we cooked it out uh, one night late, and it started raining on us. But that was my first first time last year to cut, press, and cook cane. And this year, I got a good patch coming up, and we'll uh, I'll call you and have you come out and be a part of it. And uh, it's uh, it's a lot of hard work. But it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I guess you got to crush the stalk, and how do you get the sugar out of that stalk? Well, you cut the cane, you strip it, and you run it through this press, and it goes through, and the and the 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 water comes out of the cane and runs into a bucket, and then we we strain that, and then it goes into a cooking vat, and. Um, we cooked down, I think we made eight gallons of syrup last year. Um, this year, I'll probably cook down about 70 gallons. That's what we're, we're hoping for, about 70 gallons of syrup. It takes, it takes anywhere from eight to 10 gallons of uh, sugar water to make a gallon of syrup once you cook all the water out of it. And uh, it's just black strap sugar cane syrup, and it's good. Like molasses? Yeah, it's good. How thick is it? Well, there again, it, it goes through stages in your cooking, and you can pull it off yeah. at different stages of where it's light and it's, it's pourable, or either you can take it on down to where it's, it's just thick molasses, which you don't want it there. And I have temperatures and stuff I take it to, and by watching the bubbles in the in it cooking you know when it's right yeah. and uh, what will happen is is when you run that that ladle down in the in the syrup you pick it up what will happen is where it's dripping off it'll it'll drip so you got to cook it a little bit longer you run it in there again you bring it up and what it'll do it'll sheet it'll just sheet on the bottom and when it starts sheeting like that and breaking off it's ready. It's ready to take the fire out from underneath it. And uh, is that different than a grist mill? A grist mill, uh, it'll make flour, cornmeal, and grits. Um, we don't have wheat berries here, so I make cornmeal and grits with it. And it's two big round stones in this mill, and it was. 
it was driven by uh, uh, either horse drawn or they had uh, the old single cylinder farm engines back then that would run it. I heard it called hit and miss engines. Hit and miss engines, yeah, and I have I have some. And uh, anyway, it's 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 another thing that you got to get used to and and doing because I had nobody to teach me. And um, over the years, I've gotten with people that have shown me little things about it, and it's just getting the stones right and. Uh, uh, I have friends up the country in uh, North Carolina and different places like that that I talk to on uh, on the web about it, and I've learned from them how to how to run a grist mill. And uh, yeah, this uh, this year I'll be making more uh, cornmeal and grits. I'll get you some. So where did you get the grist mill? That was part of of what was there. Uh, that old grist mill, there was pieces missing from it, and I had to go through a company called Meadows Mills. And um, Meadows, I, I got old parts from them, from old mills they had, and put it together and, and completely rebuilt it and painted it, and it's 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 a nice piece. That's really cool. So, so uh, on the. The Decker side, did they mainly run cattle or did they farm or both or what? Both. Do? Yeah. What what kind of farming would they do? Uh, corn, uh, potatoes, uh, beans, just a little bit of everything. Because you didn't have the stores back then. You know, Tomball wasn't here then. Yeah. And, um, but, um, I've got pictures my grandmother took of Tomball back in the day when there was just a, a few buildings there. And, uh, but, um, like I say, Decker, Decker Prairie and in Rose Hill, New Kentucky, you know, uh, New Kentucky was where Sam Houston came through on his way to Harrisburg. So it was an unestablished village there. And then, uh, Derek Prairie, there wasn't anything here but, you know, a few people, you know, coming up. So it was like a crossroads. Yeah. So you had to farm yeah. to have food year round, put it up, can it, whatever you had to do. Sounds like another history. I mean, another hobby you have is gardening. I love to garden. Yes. Tell us about that. Oh, I grow a big crop of um, potatoes every year. I grow my own corn. Um, okra, uh, and my sugar cane, um, watermelons, just you name it. I, I grow everything that, that can be grown in a garden that, that I like to eat. And I bought me a, you know, we can for a, for a long time. And I finally, you get so much food, you just have to give it away. And with the way times have gotten and stuff, uh, I, I bought me a freeze dryer and I freeze dry a lot of the stuff that comes out of the garden and uh, it lasts 25 years. So, uh, you know, it's June right now. I'm going to be 70 years old. So I might not have to freeze dry too much longer. <laughs> so, <laughs> It lasts till you're 100. Huh? <laughs> yeah, so that's pretty good. Yeah. What kind of <clears throat> businesses and ways to make a living have you been involved in through your life? Oh my gosh. Um, well, when my dad would was coming up, we had tractors, and he. Uh, he had a contract with the state and we we mowed uh highway right of ways and i finally got my own tractors and that was uh, i guess my my first and i involved uh a dump truck in with it during off season i had a dump truck i hauled dirt so going back to the 
highway mowing. What kind of tractors did y'all have back then? Madison Ferguson. <clears throat> and uh, there was a man here in Tombow, you probably know him. He had Madison Ferguson tractors that we bought from. <laughs> so, yeah, it was my dad. <laughs> your dad, yep. I, I had a uh, soft spot in my heart for Madison Ferguson tractors. Those oh, were fun, yeah. fun tractors back then. Yeah. All right, and you were telling us about other businesses you got involved in? Oh, well, like I say, the, the, I helped my dad in the, in the, in the uh, development and uh, cutting up part of pieces of, of, of land that he had, my grandmother had, and developed them Kipling Oaks, Go Country, uh, Co Loop. Um, gosh, there's, uh, I, I don't know of them all, but when he would develop a, a subdivision, he would put a well system in, a water well system. Uh, to help, you know, supply the water for the people. And uh, so that became a business all its own. Uh, and it really wasn't meant to be that a business in its own. It just evolved. And so uh, me and my brother started taking care of the, of the well systems and and the drilling end of it uh we had different drillers that would come in and drill the wells for us and um i eventually got into the drilling myself and um my dad sold the water utility company in 96 and i took my drilling uh, to a, a different level i did water wells and i did uh sample core drilling and um, I did that for a while. And when 9-11 hit, well, everything just quit. And I sold my, my rigs and the company that my dad uh, sold to uh, wanted me to come back and run the company for them, straighten some things out that had, that had happened. And I said, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll do that. And I'll stay with you for a little while, a year, a year or so. Well, I've been back 20 years and uh, they treat me really good and I can't, I can't complain. I enjoy it. Uh, like I say, I'm fixing to be 70 years old and I love getting up every morning and going and, and seeing my guys and my girls in the office and, and, uh, um, you know, just seeing them and going to work. So that's great. So your dad, A.R. Arbor Co. He had. He told us about the the lumber yard, and he sold the Nidic Lester Nidic, and he had the concrete plant. What else did he do around Tomball? Uh, well, the development. Yeah. And. Um, the water co, co utilities. Yeah. yeah. And um, we had the sawmill, which that wasn't, you know, a, a, a driven, you know, business. When we got logged, we sawed them and sold some lumber, you know. But Where'd you get your sawmill? Uh, I, I, I started it. Uh, the one, the, the sawmill that he had in Decker Prairie, uh, Right there where Morris Road wide off, he had a sawmill right there in Decker Prairie. And that was, he, he made all the lumber and stuff for the, the company in Tombaugh. And uh, he got to doing so good, he, he didn't have time to run the sawmill and, and that, so he started buying lumber. And uh, uh, he sold the little mill, that, the circle mill that was in Decker Prairie there at that Y. Uh, there was a store there called Lane's Store. And then behind it, there was another store on that Y that peeled off there called McGraw's. His sawmill was right past it, just right past there. And uh, we, uh, he got rid of it. So getting back to how that mill evolved, I started finding old mills and stuff that uh, either burned down 
and I, I found carriage parts and stuff and I built a carriage, got the, par the carriage all put together and everything. And uh, my dad was giving me pointers on, you know, how to uh, adjust it and make it and this and that. And I built the track and everything and I started setting it up down on my 22 acres down uh, behind Co Country. And one day he come down there and he said, uh, I notice you're not doing much on the mill anymore. What's wrong? I said, well, Papa run out of money. And uh, he said, well, how about me helping you and we'll get the mill, mill going. So he started helping me. We got the mill done and it was way more a mill than I ever expected. We had a edger and and it took it took a good uh, three people could run it slow. Four people was a little faster. Five people it it, it ran like a singer sewing machine. But uh, yeah, it it it, it swung a, a fifty four inch. Uh, saw inserted two saw, and uh, it was a good times down there. Hard work. What did you power it with? Um, we powered it with a uh, a four cylinder diesel, and uh, it wasn't horse drawn, but, but <laughs> yeah. no four cylinder diesel engine. And you told us uh, you got your first cow from your uncle Lester Goodson. Yeah. What kind of cows was he running? What kind of cow did you get from him? He gave us two Hereford uh, mama cows, and they were young, and that's how Harvey and I got our start in the in the cattle business. And uh, uh, right, I know right before. Uh, no, we still had cattle. I was taking care of the cattle back then. And uh, I want to say when he got back from Vietnam, he sold sold his his part of the cattle. And I kept mine for, for a little bit longer, not long, because like I say, in 1970 is when Dad started subdividing. But we had the pasture there in, in Decker Prairie, and we kept them there for a while. But as far as the years and knowing that, I, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of operation did Lester Goodson have there on his place? He had race horses. He had uh, uh, quarter horses, and I worked there. I worked there for a while, helped him out, and uh, I built some brood barns uh, for him. I hauled dirt, uh, hauled gravel on the back roads in in and back through there, and I guess you know now it's called High Meadow Ranch. And uh, I used to hunt there a little bit, and uh, that was a big place, right? Yeah. And him and Aunt Margaret had moved to uh, Conroe, so uh, nobody was living in the main farmhouse. And uh, yeah, they moved. They moved to Conroe, and uh, he would come out every every evening. He had a Pontiac dealership out off of. Well, he had one in downtown Houston at one time, and then he moved out toward uh, off of 45 and West Road, somewhere right in that area there. And uh, every day, almost every day, he would come out to the ranch and uh, check on, see what, what was going on, what we got done. And I worked with an old fellow named Bootsy Moore. He was a carpenter. And uh, yeah, we we had we had some good times. So you mentioned uh, Doc Coe's cattle operation. That sounded like it was pretty big too, right? Yeah, uh, Wheeler and I we we get together every once in a while. We talk, and he said that a man was asking my my grandfather said, "Well, uh, how big a how big a." ranch you got and he said well he said it's so many acres every money you want and he said well how many cattle you run on it well see back then it was all open range and my grandfather told him he says a little over two thousand head that's hard to imagine that's a lot of cows but they had cow camps uh, in a couple of different places uh 
one over in Egypt and, and Lake Creek Bottom. And uh, uh, my dad, my dad was worked cattle and stayed at, at those camps. And uh, I remember visiting the, the camps later on uh, uh, by vehicle. You know, then, I mean, it was all horseback back then, but uh, we would drive to them and, and uh, they weren't being used as cattle camps then. But I, I, I remember going to one cattle camp they had in, off of Little Egypt. And uh, yeah, they would stay, stay there for a week or two at a time, working cattle. Was that back when it was still open range? Yeah. And Little Egypt, tell us roughly where it is up there. Uh, 2978 and 1488 that's that's little egypt through and through that area and i've heard of lake creek whereabouts is that lake creek bottom is just um it's it's south of there and it it runs um the old superior oil company ran all back in lake creek bottom and it ran all the way back down um gosh all that area almost back to old magnolia all the way up through new magnolia all that that north of there was lake creek bottom yeah and we and they ran cattle all all in their open range and uh the old mama cow they always had a bale on her and that's how they would find the cattle they had a bale on the old mama the uh the mama cow one one of the mama cows had a bale on them. And those cattle would always follow her. It was it was something else. Mm. Yeah. So it, it Code Lumber Company sounded like he cut his own lumber with his own sawmill, and then he sold it. And on yeah, Street. and it, it it got too much running both operations, and then he started buying uh, lumber. Mm. So yeah. I know you've gotten into research in Texas history, and you were mentioned to us earlier about New Kentucky Park. What have you read or researched about that? Oh, I got in a little argument the other day with a fella that was telling me about the Witchaway tree. And um, New Kentucky Village, you know, that was where Sam Houston came through going to, to uh, Harrisburg, which was the capital of Texas, uh, I, I believe, back during that time. Um, and I know that a, a steamboat, uh, I think after Harrisburg got burned down, I, I believe that they set up um, on a steamboat called the Cayuga. Uh, don't, yeah, I believe it was the, the Cayuga that, uh, what was it, Burnett was the president then? And, um, but anyway, talk, talking about that, that, he came through there and he asked the people of New Kentucky Village, he said, which way is Harrisburg? And there was a fork in the road. And they said, if you go to the left, it takes you to Nacogdoches. If you go to the right, it takes you to Harrisburg, which is now Houston, part of Houston. And um, so there's a tree there, and they call that tree the Witchaway tree. Well, later on they found out, or everybody was saying, oh, the Witchaway tree is inside the park by the bathrooms. It's a big oak tree in there. Well, they found out later on they did a, a, a test, and that's not the Witchaway tree. It's not old enough. The Witchaway tree is across the highway in front of the Roadhouse Cafe or restaurant. And I was talking to Callie, the owner, here not too long ago. They came out and they tested that tree. And it is of age to be the Witchaway tree because he showed me. He said the road split here. And he said it goes back and he showed me where it went back on his property, this side of an old pond. And that's that was the road that went to... Uh, Harrisburg and back the other way it went to uh, 
Nacogdoches. Well, I've seen that tree. It's a beautiful big oak. It's kind of got the long yeah. spreading uh -huh. branches that come out. Yeah. So. That's a cool tree. Yeah. So tell me about your boating and your uh, interest in the steamboats. Oh, my gosh. Uh, there's a there was a steamboat in 1836 when Sam Houston was camped west of the Brazos. That's where that's where Sam had planned on having the battle was right there in Raccoon Bend, just right outside of of uh, Hempstead. Uh, that's why he stayed there so long. He was going to fight the battle right there. He thought that Santa Ana would come up from San Felipe and find them there, and the battle would be there. Well, found out later that, that Santa Ana had crossed the river down below uh, San Felipe because the everything had been burned, and they couldn't cross there. So he went down uh, past there and found a way to cross, and... Uh, so when Sam found that out, he, uh, and the reason I know all this is because I'm real good friends with the, the landowner, and I get to go down there anytime I want to. And uh, I, I went down there and I got to figuring out if, you, if you're standing there and you're looking back south towards San Felipe, you know why he set up there. Because you can see the whole everything. And you knew that that Santa Ana wasn't going to come up the river because it was at flood stage. And so he had the perfect spot. He had it to where they could not retreat. They had to fight that battle right there. There was no running. They had to fight, fight. I mean, you know, to, uh, to stand their own ground. Well, when he found out there was a, a steamboat called the Yellowstone and he had uh, contacted uh, the captain of the steamboat about moving the troops across there and because right on the other side was a town called Bernardo and it was it was started by a man by the name of Jared, Jared Gross and uh, so that's where he picked up the twin sisters the cannons two cannons and uh, that's where they were delivered to so anyway, uh, it took seven trips for them to move uh, Sam Houston's troops across. They got them all across to the other side. And that's where, like I say, that's where he got the twin sisters. And they took off from there and uh, camped, camped again, uh, I believe, the next night at where A.J. Fort Road is they camped somewhere right in that area where AJ Foyt and 2920 is. So the next the next morning when they left and they came into New Kentucky, that's when they uh, we're talking about the Witchway tree. But anyway, talking about the steamboat, the steamboat moved them over. And Sam Houston even said if it hadn't have been for the steamboat Yellowstone playing a part of, of history. No telling what would where Texas would be today if it hadn't have helped in, in moving them across. So anyway, the long story short, I've been um, hooked on wanting to know more about the Yellowstone. And I've got a place over on the Brazos River, just right down from where Sam Houston had his camp. So for years, I've wanted to make a a history trip from where Sam camped on the Brazos and I wanted to go all the way down the Brazos and then from the Brazos I wanted to go up the Intercoast Canal to Galveston from Galveston to San Jacinto from San Jacinto go up Buffalo Bayou to where they captured Santa Ana well it's been a long road it's been 17 years since I've been working on this I've been through Two other boats than the one that I'm working on now, and I'm just about through with it. So it, it being hurricane season, maybe we'll get a little rain and that river will come up, and uh, uh, a, a 
pray that nobody gets hurt in a hurricane just because I want to make a trip. But uh, anyway, uh, it's it's all been mapped out, computerized on on maps and stuff. It's a hundred and eighty three miles from Saint where Sam camped down the Brazos, and that's one hundred eighty three miles of squiggling back and forth until you get to what back then was called Quantana. And so I'll get to Freeport, which it'd be Freeport. From there, I go to Galveston. From there on, it's a hunt. It's two hundred. I think it's two hundred and two hundred and forty-seven or two hundred and fifty miles from where I start to where I, I finish. And where are you going to finish at? At where uh, where uh, Santa Ana was captured. And if you want to know where the capture site is, the Washburn Tunnel where it comes out on the south side, if you come through the Washburn Tunnel and you turn back, as soon as you turn back after coming out and come back around, that's where uh, Santa Ana was captured. And that's, that's the picture that shows where Sam Houston is sitting there and he's got his foot, uh, he's laying there on the ground by a big oak tree and he's, he's got his foot up with a bandage around it because he was, he was shot in that ankle. And... Uh, that's the picture of uh, on Buffalo Bayou where he was where he was captured. So, what's one of your favorite memories about growing up in this area? I don't know. High school was good. I got I got through high school uh, by the skin of my teeth. I uh, I was always daydreaming about what I wanted to be doing at home, you know, with with my dogs or cattle or you know whatever, you know. And, uh, but, uh, I was good friends with the Bohannons. The Bohannons lived there in Decker Prairie. We ran the creeks and stuff back then. And, uh, it was just a good time. So, well, we sure appreciate you spending the time today to meet with us. And, uh, we'll get together again sometime. Thank you. All right.